Welcome to Carlow County Council's Decade of Centenaries video series, brought to you by Carlow Libraries and Carlow County Museum, funded by the Department of Tourism, Culture, Arts, Gwaeltacht, Sport and Media. Hello and you're very welcome to this special presentation. Um, this uh, presentation is brought to you today by Carlow County Library and the County, uh, Carlow County Museum as part of the Carlow County Council's Decade of Centenaries. During this series of podcasts, we hope to present to our listeners interesting stories and insights that will give us all a better understanding of those turbulent times. Uh, 1918 to 1922 is uh, what we're discussing today. My name is Bernie Walsh. And I'm joined today by Dr. Ida Milne, uh, who I'm delighted to be here with. And uh, you're very welcome, Dr. Milne. Thank you very much for having me. And indeed, welcome here to, to the Constance Markovich uh, room in Carlo College as well. Mm, it's a beautiful room, really gorgeous. Um, can you tell me a bit about your work here in the college? Here in the college, I'm European history lecturer. So I teach um, a wide range of courses across the four years of the BA degree in Humanities and in English and History. Uh, things like um, the, about the rise of fascism, about the First World War, uh, about revolutions in Paris. And then uh, something I think is particularly per pertinent to Carlo is our place in Europe uh, in the, in the post-First um, World War, uh, sorry, sorry po post-Second World War period. Uh, you know, when the idea of European agriculture for us here in Carlow and then yes. the southeast in general becomes very important to our local economy. And I actually, as a farmer's daughter from the southeast, I, I really love teaching about that to, to my students. You look like you have a very good interest in it. Yeah, yeah. I do. Yeah. I really and enjoy do. what you do. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, it's a privilege to have students. It's, um, you know, something those of us who do the PhD route spend many years trying to get lecturing posts. And when you do get one, it's, it's just lovely. Mm. And um, I'm really pleased, having spent years in Dublin, Maynooth, and in Queens and Belfast, to be back in the southeast, you know, where my people have been for something like 400 years. I, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. But I do think it's very important that we enjoy what we do. You know, yeah, what I absolutely love what yeah. I do. And I teach in a lovely place with great colleagues yeah. and lovely students. Good. That's and great. then, of course, good colleagues in the local community <laughs> and the libraries and the local yes. history societies as yeah. well. And can we talk about disease in general in that, that particular time? Um, what kind of diseases were about um, in, in, well, in, in the whole of Ireland or specifically, I think, Dublin? And when we look at the Spanish or the 1918-19 flu, as I prefer to call it, um, people often wonder with our modern lens why... Uh, we don't know more about it and why historians didn't consider it such a big deal until recent years. Mm. And I think that's because, or one of the reasons is because um, there was so much disease in Irish society and in, um, you know, countries even in the global north as well as the poorer countries in the world. And what kind of disease would you be talking about? So you're talking in, uh, in an Irish context, you'd be talking about thousands dying each year from TB, the year of the flu, uh, the first year of the flu, 10,400 died from the flu, but over 9,000 died from TB, and that number would be dying each year right. um, in the 1910s from TB. And then the other big killers were bronchitis. Of course, there was no antibiotics to um, deal with the bacterial um, bronchitis, uh, pneumonias and other diseases at that mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. Bronchitis and pneumonias were, were the other big killers. But... Um, one of the interesting things from our, our modern lens, again, is the diseases against which we have vaccinations, uh, like measles um, were killing five or six hundred a year. Whooping cough was killing five or six hundred a year. Diphtheria was killing two or three hundred a year. Um, uh, scarlet fever, uh, which is, I think, a bacterial disease, was killing maybe five or six hundred a year as well. Mm. So the attrition rate, particularly amongst children under the age of five, was absolutely appalling. One fifth of the deaths on the island each year, 20% of all deaths, were of children under the age of five. Mm -hmm. And that's something that always brings a tear to my eye because yeah, we yeah. just can't imagine how much safer our children are today mm. 
yes. and why we shouldn't take things like vaccination for granted. Yes. But in those days, there would have been 70,000 or more deaths on the island each Gosh, year. Whereas a in a non-COVID year now, we'd have about 30,000 on the whole island. Right, okay. So it's a huge difference. And then there was a large amount of births as well around that time, I suppose, in, in that year era. And then you've losing children as well. So Yeah, one yeah. lady I interviewed was James Larkin's granddaughter, Stella McConnell Larkin. And her mother grew up in the tenements in Dublin, you know, the ones where the death rates were so high yes, and where yeah. the conditions, the mm. environmental conditions, you mm. know, that no mm. running water, uh, which we now know is so important, even, is, for, yeah. even for COVID, never mind in, yeah. in 1918, 19. Um, you know, they'd have to haul a bucket of water upstairs. So you can imagine how difficult hand washing for, was exactly. for them. Yeah. And then they'd have no running um, water in yes. houses and no toilet. Yes. And so Charles Cameron, who was the chief medical officer of health for Dublin and a, a man who did an awful lot to fix the health of Dubliners, he said his dream was that every family in the country would have running water and a toilet. Yes. And you know, that's the luxury we have now. Yes, I know. We don't really appreciate it. And that it did happen. It did happen. Yeah. He, he made sure that that happened. Yeah. Um, they had massive housing campaigns from the 1910s onwards. Um, you know, and both in under the old regime and in the in the, the new Ireland as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, do you know what type of social living was in in the the whole of Ireland? Like, I know the tenements in Dublin, but where would, what kind of houses would people have actually lived in around that time of? Well, in a lot of the cities, there were still te tenement dwellings. Um, they had begun or made good progress in doing things like introducing sewage um, schemes, like organised town sewage. But that wasn't the case even in, you know, um, quite a well-off town like Nace in 1918, mm. which is one of the reasons why Nace is thought to have one of the highest rates of, of um, uh, death in the country for, from the Great Flu. Mm -hmm. um, but they were beginning to do that. that certainly most towns by then had a clean supply of water. Um, since, you know, the discovery of the connection between cholera and the water supply, John Snow's famous um, mm. pump yes. yeah. experiment or pump, pump, pump um, um, epidemiology work uh, discovered that. And from then on, um, places, um, you know, towns really began to get clean water supplies as and when they could afford or organise them. Yes. Um, was it an unusual... Um, a disease that came and what was it the soldiers who brought it back from the war i've often heard that it was the the first world war soldiers that actually brought it back to ireland and is that a myth or is that a truth it, in some ways it's a myth and in other ways it's, it points to a very complex question i mean i've heard of soldiers who um you see because ireland was quite close to the war and yet separate from the war um when soldiers would get you know they, they, they weren't at the front all the time they would get some downtime Hmm. And sometimes they would come back or maybe, you know, uh, Canadian soldiers of Irish with Irish connections or whatever would come hmm. over to Ireland hmm. or to Dublin. And I've heard of some soldiers who, um, you know, had this sort of cold symptoms and but were determined to make the most of their uh, break and would travel all over Dublin on the trams oh, and would then yes. come down with the flu very yes, badly. Yeah, so yeah. goodness knows how many they spread it to. Yeah, so. uh, but People talk about it happening with demobilisation, but demobilisation didn't happen until uh, the end of April 1919. And by then, the three waves of the flu in Ireland, uh, the three biggest, the second and third were the biggest killing ones, but they had essentially uh, passed. Okay. And I suppose the other interesting thing is um, um, a lot of the military were transported on special trains, you know, yes, so, uh, yeah. you know, so... So it's very similar to the way the pandemic of today is uh, being throughout the whole communities. Yeah, yeah, um, so yeah. they kind of yeah. were showing symptoms and then they, it developed into this uh, yeah. major flu. What is really interesting, I was involved in a project uh, in Glasnevin with TCD School of Histories. And uh, Frank Ludlow there is a great historical geographer in Trinity. Mm -hmm. He mapped, along with Georgina Larrigue, another colleague of mine, um, the flu by poor law unions. And when he, we had a brainwave and said, let's put the barracks over the map, oh, we could then yes, see yeah, very clearly. So yeah. this is not 
not the kind of expeditionary forces, but the, the, the troops that would have been in Ireland anyway, yes. uh, that you can see quite clearly the, the spread around the barracks right. and to a certain extent along the train lines, but then population follows the train lines, so you would expect that anyway. Yes, and did it yeah. affect Carlo? Yeah, um, the uh, flu came in three waves. The first wave is in May, June, early July, um, 1918. That's quite limited, mostly up in uh, Ulster and in Belfast. Mm -hmm. And then at the second wave, it's um, really the middle of October through December uh, 1918. And then in February through April 1919, the bulk of the deaths take place in those second, two, second and third waves. Um, but Carlo, when you look at the county death statistics, County Carlo, along with Wicklow and Kildare, which had the highest rate in the, in the country, mm. Carlo, uh, Kildare, Kilkenny were all really bad with the flu. Wexford mm. too, to a certain extent, and of course Dublin. And then in the north, um, um, Donegal, because it had very interesting connections in that uh, both had a lot of seasonal labour coming to and from Scotland. Yes. Yeah. And it had, which was a real surprise for me, um, I interviewed a lady, uh, Katie McMenamin, who was 106 when I interviewed her by phone. Right. She had That's a great marvellous age. recall. Yeah. And she said, no, dear, it wasn't so much um, the migration as the fact that the Navy were based in Loch Swilly. So they were taking shelter from mm, the mm. from the U-boats, which were knocking out uh, Irish fishing ships, freight ships, etc. And of course, the um, the trying to get at the troops coming over from America at that stage yeah. as well. So she said that the the um, soldiers and sailors there would come into the community and spread it around, mm -hmm. and that they were treated in the local hospitals rather than on ships generally. Mm -hmm. And indeed, her mother nursed some of them. So she was about fifteen when it happened. So she had quite a good memory of it. I remember my grandmother. Um, she would have been about twelve at the time, yeah. and I remember her telling us stories of them taking the coffins, they used to go on horse-drawn carriage down yeah. to the, the graveyard and bury a child and then come back up and take another child out of the family. And she remembers that, that there was an awful lot of death in around her area. What area in, was that for me? She's in, well, she's just outside Gorey, which yeah. is in um, a place called Anna, which is yes. near Hollyfort. So she remembers it really well, and uh, she remembers losing some of her school pals. You know, oh, children that would have went to school with her would have died, but none of them got it. None of her family got it. They were very lucky, and they were surrounded by the flu. So I think some families did escape, and others didn't. I remember interviewing Marianne Rosam, who was from near Monagir. Yes. And she was in her, I think, her 90s when I interviewed her, but she told me that when the celebrations, each town would have had bonfires and celebrations for the end of the war. Yes. And she said when that happened, um, she said they had quite a big family and that um, her parents wouldn't let them go into Enniscorthy for the bonfires. And they were, of course, raging yeah, with them. Yeah, of course they but would. They, said they, <laughs> yeah. they, they, they reckoned that the flu would travel really quickly in those yes. communities. And yeah. sure enough, uh, my colleague Patricia Marsh, who's done work in the flu in Ulster, she said when she looked, she could see spikes in the deaths about a, for, a fortnight later. Yes. Uh, probably to do with those celebrations for the end of war. So when uh, I was actually on the Sean O'Rourke programme, just before St. Patrick's Day last year, and he said, like, based on the statistics for the flu, would you advise not have, not uh, staying open, not having St. Patrick's Day in the normal way? And I said, yeah, I have to say, yes. you would, you know? Yeah, it's a, mm. it's a, it's a good idea, yeah. really, yeah. yeah, to try and but keep it in one area. The numbers of multiple deaths that you see in one family, mm -hmm. they're extraordinary. You know, yeah. small little towns, yeah. we focus on... We do a lot of focus, I suppose, as Irish historians on what happened in the Dublin tenements, but the newspapers in the southeast are full of tragic stories like your grandmother's. Yes. Uh, you yeah. know, there's one I had from near Bunclody, um, where I think there were three children taken away in the hearse at the same time. Aww. And then the ambulance came to bring the father and the mother and the rest of the family off to the devastating, hospital. Devastating. Yeah. Really devastating yeah. times. Yeah. And really, uh, you know, it's such a loss, such a, a really yeah. a great loss yeah. for, for families. Uh, yeah, my grandmother said that uh, she couldn't understand why she escaped and all her family escaped and the next door neighbours got it and the ones on the other side of them. Now there was probably, you know, two fields between yeah. each of the, of the houses, 
but she couldn't understand it. She wondered why. Tell me, know. did she ever catch flus after that? She was never really sick. She lived till she yeah. was 90 and she never really was sick. She did get pneumonia once, but that was later on in her life. She was about 85 mm. or six when she got it. But she really never got sick. I was curious about that yeah. because I interviewed Nellie O'Toole from Rathvilly. She was well over 100 mm. when I interviewed her. And she told me she actually never caught a cold in her life. Really? Yeah. But when the flu came to Rathvilly, all her family and her aunt's family, most of the, the road, Phelan's Row, where she lived in Rathvilly, was related to her. Mm. And she said uh, that Lord Rathdonnell uh, sent his uh, workmen down with soup um, for oh, yes. the people who were yeah. sick. Yeah. And that Nellie herself would actually take the saucepans out of the houses and bring them to him. I think she was about nine at the time. Yes. And she, she would bring it into each house. And she said even though her brother caught it and he yeah. was so sick, he was banging his head uh, with the pain in his head. Um, she said she never caught it. And she stayed well right throughout. It's amazing, it. yeah. isn't it? How, how it can affect some people and other people's just escape. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What kind of therapies did they use in them days for... Uh, for to cure the, the well, flu. It's really fascinating and the doctors, um, the Royal Academy of Medicine in Ireland was so shocked at what was going on in November 1918 they got together and they shared, they pooled all their ideas. So they talk about getting something um, to cure the headache uh, which was usually quinine I think in those oh, days and that would yeah. also be used to relieve the fever. They did have aspirin as well but not in as common use as it was now. Yes. And aspirin in America um, was made by Bayer. Bayer was a German company, so they thought that Bayer had infected the aspirin boxes <laughs> with the flu, and that's what was spreading oh, it. Right, but yeah. they also used extraordinary things by our, you know, our present day eyes, uh, like a, a tincture of creosote. Oh, right. Uh, to gargle with. Oh, and my in my mind, soon your throat would go away as well as your cold would go away. <laughs> I can away. imagine that. Yeah. And the they smell also, of it, even. In some, uh, there was an awful lot of whiskey and brandy used, and it's now known that whiskey has antiviral properties, so it makes a lot yeah. of sense. Yeah. And the other thing that uh, one of the reactions to this was something that uh, three or four years ago we probably wouldn't have known, uh, we, but we now know it was a cytokine storm. Oh, right. An overreaction, to put it simply, an overreaction of the immune system to the bug within the body. Right. And they think this is the reason why that particular flu hit young, strong adults. It often hit sports people and the like, you know. Right, yeah. And um, some people discovered that if you kept people that age constantly, mildly drunk, uh, they survived. And I've heard a few people have told me stories within their own family yes. of that kind of survival. Yeah, yeah. Not too much, just can't. It's not something I'm advising in case, <laughs> in case anybody rings in. Uh, but in some parts, particularly in Ulster, um, the use of whiskey or alcohol was very much disapproved of. So yeah. the local doctors felt they needed to give something, so they gave strychnine. And strychnine, again, you know, our generation thinks of as being James Bond's would-be assassin's <laughs> yes, poison exactly, choice. Yes, exactly, yes. You know. But um, they would they only give it in a minute do yes, doses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that it would kind of stimulate, it was acted as a stimulant. It wouldn't be enough to kill, obviously. Right. That wasn't the purpose. Okay. Um, but the other thing, they, they, they believed a lot in nursing therapies. And, and, you know, Sir Charles Cameron, again, would say yes, yeah. the people survive with good nursing, so plenty of fluids and a light gruel. And I remember one guy I interviewed in Kildare, very near my home, um, or my current home, um, Tommy Christian said they gave us plenty of gruel and he laughed. He said it had an awful lot of responsibilities. And I said, what did you mean by that, Tommy? And he said, well, it made us go to the loo as well. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, so they were yeah. kind of obsessed with making people go to the loo, keeping the bowels clear. Which Trying to important clear the days. system yeah, down. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. And I suppose if you're really sick, they gave them calomel to do that as well, which is mercurous chloride. Uh, now we'd consider it quite toxic. Yes. Uh, yeah. But in those days, it would instantly make you get up and go to the loo. So yeah. probably if you're feeling well enough to go to the loo, you say, oh, I'm feeling better now. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. But there were folk remedies too, like, you know, gargles with garlic and things like that. Too. I'd say they used a lot of herbal remedies yeah. as well. Yeah. If it doesn't cure you, it'll kill you. <laughs> they talk a lot in the newspapers about every second person in Enniscorth or in Carlow reeking of eucalyptus. They'd put eucalyptus right. oil on, on, on them. There wasn't really much evidence of masking in Ireland, but an awful lot of people put scarves around their faces. Right, okay. And yeah. would douse that in eucalyptus because they thought it would keep it away. Yeah. 
but it would certainly, I suppose, help to keep their air passages clear. Yeah, it certainly yeah. would. Yeah, One it's guy, like the Vic. <laughs> Tommy Christian, who I just mentioned, he said he did his first do- taste of hot punch when he was five. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And do you think that um, poverty and conditions uh, contributed to the general spread of the, f- of the flu? Oh, yeah. I mean, when you look at the tenements in Dublin and realise how densely populated they were, they had to have... A flu, that flu was often t- spoken of afterwards as being a socially neutral disease, like the King of Spain got it, Alfonso the Thirteenth, which is why it's called Spanish flu. Oh, right. Uh, he and his courtiers got it. Okay. And it wasn't yeah. being reported um, from the combat of armies in the war, but it was actually running through them at the time. Um, so the, 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 the belligerent countries weren't talking about it as much. It was very openly mentioned in the Spanish papers. Mm. Um, but... Uh, that's why it, was, why it was called Spanish flu. Okay, so you've written a book, <laughs> The Stacking of the Coffins. Mm. I have a copy of it in the library, thank you. <laughs> and um, uh, what kind of research did you have to do when you were writing that book? Uh, well, I started doing it for my MA research in right, 2005 okay. and kind of really fell in love with it and felt I needed to, to, I couldn't stop there because there's so much work and there's still, Oh, what with 2021 now, I, I yeah. could still do as much research again on it. Mm. Um, I used a lot of the um, historical statistics, the, the death certification. Mm. Uh, that was really helpful. Uh, newspapers, I spent a lot of time um, going through the Carla Nationalist and the Wexford papers in the first place because they were actually really good newspapers. Yes. They gave really detailed accounts. Yeah. Some newspapers hardly deal with it yeah Um, yeah but others really are rich so Kilkenny newspapers um were terrific Kilkenny was really badly struck by it Uh, Uh, John Street all along the streets there yes um an awful lot of families were struck by it and you'll see even if you are reading my book some quite well-known families you know that are still around today yes who, who were struck by it um so I used newspapers, but I suppose the most exciting source I had was, um, uh, I think my supervisor in Trinity, Professor David Dixon, was probably getting a bit cheesed off early on, reading an <laughs> awful lot of statistical work and thinking, oh golly, how am I going to survive the four years with this? We have to make it more interesting. Yeah. And um, he said, there's still a window to collect uh, living memory. Mm-hmm. And in those days, I was awfully shy. And the idea of going out... Um, to try and find people and get them to talk about something really intimate and personal, which would have made them ill or maybe maybe kill their families, was, yes, was very daunting very to me. Hard, yeah. uh, so I was really lucky. A friend of mine um, in our clock, where I, I have lived for 20 years and I'm now moving to Carlo, um, was a local postman, Jim Tancred. And uh, he would find the people, he'd listen to something like the Ronan Collins show and hear people having their 90th or 90 whatever birthdays or 100 birthdays. And he would ring up and find out, you could do this in in pre-GDPR days, um, where these people were through local contacts. And we'd go and interview them. And he was actually brilliant because he was a postman at helping to settle people and to put them at ease because he was well used to dealing with yeah. And he trained me, really. Good, you know. yeah. He was yeah. terrific. And so many of those people I interviewed, not once or even twice, but three or four times, because people would uh, go back and find more and more things as, as they went on. But what I found really fascinating uh, was when I started interviewing in 2006, unless people had a very strong awareness of it, for some reason there was a shopkeeper in Lucan, who had read a lot of newspapers and she was five or six when it happened and she could tell a great story about it and set it in international uh, context, uh, Elizabeth. And then Arby McDowell, who I interviewed in Trinity, was a historian and he was able to set his experiences as a five-year-old in Belfast getting it. And they bring these stories to life. They they actually make them real. Yeah. 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 So you really enjoyed doing that. um, But then there was kind of a change in the memory when the 2009 flu pandemic happened in Mexico. Oh, and right. there was a lot of more material on the television about it. Yes. And that meant that when I went to interview people, they knew more about it. Oh, so that was really right. interesting. Yes. And then finally, by the time um, 2018 came along uh, for the centenary anniversary, I was, I was working here. I just began working here in Carlo at that stage. And I was really delighted because a lot of the local history societies, uh, Great Namana, Carlo, um, 
you know, in Wexford and in Waterford and in Kilkenny all invited me in to talk. Mm -hmm. And that was not a one-way street. It was a two-way street because often yes. the audiences would be quite big. Yes. And uh, a lot of the people would have, like you had, a direct connection to the flu. Like yes. there was one lady yeah. who told me uh, of her mother, I think it was her mother, not her grandmother, being born on the floor of the local uh, mental hospital because the local hospitals were too full of flu patients and there was no place for that was thought to be the safest place she could give, give birth. Yes. And, um, a gentleman in Great Namana told me that when he came to um, work in the creamery in the 1950s, he was told that the uh, creamer workers had gone out to milk the cows because the farmers were all sick. The whole families would be down with yes. it. And then another fellow at another meeting told me that um, uh, his, um, he was, I think, about seven, and he was from Carlo, and that his entire family went down with the flu. So as a small child, he was left not only nursing the family, but also doing all the farm chores as but well. There must have been a fantastic community spirit then yeah, within, yeah. within the farming, with, within it, all sort of... Yeah. Uh, I mean, there are terrific stories in the local newspapers. There's such so such riches about it. Mm. Um, uh, there was a nurse, I think, in Thomastown. I think she was a Miss Byrne, um, who was considered to be a real hero, saving many lives. From the, the doctors, you see, because were always going sick because they were dealing with well, so many yeah, patients. Well, yeah, they were travelling around. Tommy so Christian yeah. told me the doctor near Kill, where he lived, um, came at three o'clock in the morning. And, you know, some of the doctors, when I've looked at their caseload for the day, they might have been working 18 or 19 hours a day. So it really wasn't surprising that, you know, they'd they get the flu sick. and then maybe yeah. die from exhaustion yeah. as well. I mean, they were mixing with all the, yeah. with all the patients who yeah. had it. So yeah. it was inevitable that yeah. they were going to get and again, it again, I heard some of them uh, used to swill their mouths out with whiskey as a kind of a prophylactic so that they wouldn't yeah. carry the germs along. Right. And they said it was quite successful, you know, because these people who to told me that said that yeah. those doctors never got the flu. Um, the, the undertakers and, and the uh, grave diggers would also ask for whiskey as rations if they had to mm. go into houses. Yeah, I remember my yeah. grandmother used to say, whiskey when you're sick makes you well, whiskey mm. when you're well makes you sick. Mm. <laughs> But there was a story in Lachlan Bridge that um, I think you told me once about uh, a doctor. That's right, yes. Dr. Fisher uh, went down, down with the flu and the local priest, Father Coyle, really stepped in before they could get a replacement and he went around from house to house and the newspaper reports tell us that like he changed the sheets um, he'd bring them food uh, bovril was a great therapy at the time so he'd bring bovril into them and they said he, he brought you know provisions from his own kitchen and then if they were sick enough he'd, he'd call the ambulance and get them taken away to the hospital wasn't he very good to do that Mm. Just going back to stacking the coffins, you mentioned something about um, you looked at the General Register's office for the death registers. What um, would they say on the uh, register of the death that it was actually the Spanish flu that killed the person? Or would it have something else on it? This uh, was something when I was doing my PhD, the, 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 the death certificates weren't online right. like they are okay. today, but yeah. you know, where anybody can look them up. It's one of our greatest, I think, I know. treasures. And Fantastic. of course, you're a genealogist. So Irishgenealogy.ie. Mm. <laughs> it, it, it's absolutely terrific. Yes, yeah. And when I started doing my research, I used to have to go in and pay, uh, I think it was two euro each. Yes. for each death certificate, because if yeah. you looked at the register itself, they wouldn't give you the cause of death. No. You see the death, but you wouldn't give the cause of death. Yeah. And now we have all these online. And again, that's something that when I go to local history societies, people can say, show me the death certificates they have for yes. their family. Yes. So they do give the cause. Yeah. Um, at that stage, we had, um, for a good many years, introduced um, the ICD, the International Classification of Disease, which was used in uh, Britain and in here and in many countries in Europe. The Americans used a different system at that stage, but I think they also adopt the ICD now. Mm -hmm. And um, it would only allow one cause of death in theory, but some doctors would try to get round it. You know, uh, influenza pneumonia uh, right, or something, yeah. or they would give a couple of causes. So yeah. um, a few times I've heard of uh, people who had TB dying from the flu 
and our people who had the flu but TB, it would be put down to TB but the people felt, family would have felt that there was, the flu was the immediate mm -hmm. cause of it. Mm -hmm. uh, some cases you see children in particular, uh, I, I think there's probably areas where certain doctors had a kind of a preferred diagnosis. So there was a doctor in, um, near the, in the tenements in the centre of Dublin who, who, during the second wave of the flu, described a lot of the child deaths as bronchitis. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I'm not enough medical enough to know the difference, but yes. I just wonder if that was you know, something that was kind of uh, something that he did. But in other places, you'd see the same kind of pattern, but of... of um, maybe pneumonia or, or influenza instead. Yes, because I do a little, just a check, um, just between 1918 and 1920, just to have a look at see in Carlo what people actually died of, and most of it was pneumonia yeah. around that time. There was, they didn't really mention the flu on some of the, the certificates, but then, you know, you don't know, there was be far too many deaths to go through to do um, yeah. a check to see what they actually and you see, died this of. this is the issue because mm. they might have caught uh, flu and uh, a few days later catch pneumonia. Yes. Uh, but if the doctors were being really technical, they'd only put down pneumonia as the cause of death. Mm. And I, I was stymied like that myself, you know, because yes. usually when I go to do a talk in the local history society, I'll pull down a page of these. And yes. They're quite dramatic looking. They're very you know, dramatic. You know, yeah, it's very it, emotional yeah, when, when yeah. you look at the certificate, especially if the person is belonging to you. Yeah. You know, yeah. a family yeah. member who's coming to one of your lectures and and they they see up on the, the screen. Yeah, you know. and I always try to warn them too and to say, look, you know, if there is anybody in the room who has... The death of here, you may well recognise yes. somebody yeah. here. Yeah. And um, indeed, you know, I have family members myself who died from yes. it, and yeah. my ex husband's family yes. um, had a very traumatic story um, when um, his, um, his, his, well, I suppose she'd be his cousin one step up, really, Nellie Tuberty was born prematurely, um, often pregnant women who catch the flu will go into premature labour. So her family were living up in Sligo where her father was in the RIC, in the, in the constabulary. And her mother, who was originally from Clare, died from the flu in November, October 1918. And Nellie was brought down in um, uh, a wooden box, shoe box, lined with cotton wool, all the way down to Ennis by train and then walked um, uh, on foot because they couldn't bring the pony and trap because the roads were cut up because of the military position back to the home in Coeur Clare. Uh, but her um, mother's um, um, brother-in-law, um, the husband of her aunt, um, walked into Ennis and arranged to have um, houses along the way that they, they would light a fire. Okay. To, because, of course, a two-pound baby yes. would lose heat very quickly, particularly in winter. Yes. And so he was a very clever man. And um, for three or four weeks afterwards, once they got her home, um, either he or his wife would strap her to their chest and sit beside the settle with the fire roaring warm. all night yes. and to keep her warm. She survived. And, she and survived. She'd often tell you, if anybody has ever been to Tuberty's pub in Coeur Claire, they may have met her, but she'd talk often about the time when she was so small, she was only like the size of a bag of sugar. Ah, gosh. But a really interesting thing, one of the, you know, we talk now about long COVID and about other diseases or um um, you know, once the primary infection is over, the kind of fallout that you can get, that your body yes, just yes. goes awry. There was a kind of a long flu too. And people talked about debilitation for months afterwards, but mm. they could have other issues like heart disease or whatever. Yes. But one of the sequelae is understood to be Parkinson's disease, right. that there was kind of an epidemic of Parkinson's disease in people who had caught the flu. Right. And in the house that she caught, went into, even though County Clare had the lowest death rate from flu in the whole country by a long chalk. Um, I think three members of the Corrie family there caught Parkinson's caught later. In life or? Uh, later in life, really? you know, they know when they were maybe in their 40s or 50s, oh, right. the Parkinson's yeah. came up. Yeah. And um, uh, it was some relief, I think, to my ex-husband and his family to discover, you know, when I was doing this research, you know, that might not be genetic, it might be something to do with because they were always worried they were going to get it too. Yes. Might be something to do with Nellie coming back yes. and bringing the flu into, yes. into the household. Yeah. So it was the flu that actually caused mm -hmm. the Parkinson's. Yeah. 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 
And did any county in Ireland survive, like, never had a, a flu in? Claire, Claire was the best. Mm. And I sometimes wonder if that was the West Clare Railway, you know, that right. Percy French fa famously pilloried because it, it, it kept breaking down. You yes. know, it, that if, but I also think it must have been military suppression because of that story, mm. you know, that mm. Jim Tubridy told mm. me about the roads being broken up so, so that um, uh, Nellie's um, uncle by marriage couldn't, um, drive the pony and trap into into yes. to pick her up. Yeah, that was yeah. must have been very difficult though yeah. those times. Yeah. yeah. So in 1937, um, the schools all contributed essays, and I was having a look at them the other day, and um, uh, there was a lot of them written about the Great Flu. They called it. Um, have you seen any of those stories or heard any of them? Some of them, and, and indeed the, the Folklore Commission very kindly told me about them and, and pointed me towards them. Mm. Um, and of course these were school children in what, fifth and sixth class? Yeah, I think they were them. 11 to 12 yeah. year olds. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I know again, my, my, my husband's um, grand aunt and Claire, Kathleen McMahon, she contributed to, those, to that collecting, but she didn't talk about the flu. She talked about the fairies and other things yes. instead. Yeah, well, my, my aunt, um, my well, she's, not, she's actually a first cousin of my mother's, but you know, we always used to call mm. her Auntie May. She had a story mm. in Gory in the school, but hers wasn't about the great flu. It, again, it was about fairies or, you know, some type of folklore. Mm. But I found this one um, from a William Vaughan in Tipperary. And he said, um, about 20 years ago, an epidemic called the flu spread all over the world. The, the cause was supposed to be the after effects of the European war because they did not bury their dead. So <laughs> I don't know. He must have got this story from somebody. It's very interesting that you should say that because when I began researching it in Trinity, one of the historians there said to me she had been told by a doctor was that the reason why this happened was because of the rotting corpses and the battlefields not being buried. Right. And indeed, Kathleen Lynn herself said that to a Sinn Féin meeting. She was Sinn Féin's medical officer of health. And she said that to them, the cause of this is, is the rotting corpses on, 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 on the battlefields of Europe. So this child mm. must have heard that story mm. um, from somebody. It was a worse type of flu in other countries than in Ireland, he said. Um, in America, the people who got it died and their bodies turned black. It was known as the black flu. Have you heard it being called the black yeah, flu? Yeah, and the reason for that is because um, it was often thought it was a type of plague right. because it killed people so fast when they got that symptom. Yes, yeah. But um, the lungs would fill up with, uh, being scientific, I'll call it a technical term, gunk. Right. And, you know, that they couldn't breathe, right. that the alveoli would be absolutely filled. They couldn't do their usual work oxygenating um, the, 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 body, um, yeah. the blood. And this is, we have an account from D.W. McNamara, who worked in Dublin's Matter at the time. He was a doctor, junior doctor. And he said this was a symptom that the, um, uh, the family and the doctor dreaded because it really meant the end was um, near and very few people ever recovered from, from that. Mm. And he said that, um, you know, that in the matter they used oxygen, they had oxygen at tanks at the time, but he said in his experience, they were always brought too late. And particularly once that symptom right. was already there, it wouldn't keep the lungs clear, yes. it was yeah. too late. Yeah. And he said, you know, the, 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 if you've seen anybody with a bad asthma attack, it's, it's, I've seen that happen, it's, it's alarming. Mm. Yes. Um, you know, the, 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 from the peripheries out, the, as, as the, the blood isn't oxygenated anymore, um, they start to turn purple black. and right. then black. Yeah. yeah. So he has his facts right. Mm. So he says, here in Ireland, many people died. Um, a man named Patrick O'Leary, he was a strong man. He never tackled the ass to the car. <laughs> so uh, to bring a barrel of water, he pushed the car and barrel of water himself and his, with his two hands, he got the flu and lived only one day. A young little girl named Bridget O'Leary, who lived in Mosswar, got the flu and lived only a few hours with it. Mary O'Sullivan uh, died also. Mr. and Mrs. Williams of Knockans, Hedford, were at a wedding and they danced all night and got the flu and died a few hours later.
So he has all the names of the people he does, who died. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I wonder, so, did he go on to become a reporter? I don't know. I He's don't know. very good. Yeah. He, um, but he that's did. the kind of story that you get in the newspapers, you know. Yes. That, uh, and yeah. Again, at the, the local history society, there was one person who told me when I did a talk in, in um, Westmeath, and uh, she told me that her grandfather caught the flu and the doctor told um, the gran his mother uh, to put a barrel of water beside his bed and to make him drink it. He was about 16 at the time and he drank every drop of it and was covered in sweat and they had to put several towels on him, but he lived. Oh, that was you know? great yeah. that he did yeah. live. Yeah. So is your book still available? Very much so. <laughs> It is. Yeah. It's, it's, it's available at the, the usual outlets and of course the libraries share it very widely as well. There are I think maybe 50 copies in the libraries nationwide. Very so, good. Yes. You know, it's, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's a great source of information. And I'd really. love if people brought me their own stories. I really, I really yeah, do yeah. love hearing them. I mean, yeah. they're so tragic, but what I love about um, getting those stories again, I mean, I could really nice write another book. I was going to say that to you. Do you think there's another yeah, book yeah, there? Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, what I love is that these lives were cut short. They shouldn't have been. But when we put together things like the newspaper accounts, the local history, um, the family, what the remnants of stories that family have, and look at the death certificates, is that in a way, I feel we can give them back something of a life that was cut short, yes. or at least make sense as to why that life was yes. cut short. Yes. Yeah. And I think that's one of... What I love best about what I do, I mean, people say you're always dealing with death and dying, but um, mm. in a way it's trying to restore life to people who've just become a statistic. Yes, yeah. Do you think that there's parallels with COVID? Oh, um, from the moment that the reports began to come from Wuhan, I, I have to say I felt a chill and I was watching and thinking. What primarily struck me instantly was that the news stories were so similar and also that the rate of death with my narrow um, medical experience seemed to be so different at that stage. They were saying about 2%, 2.5% of those who got it in Wuhan were dying. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, maybe more, but that's what we were told at the time. And that seems to be about the general rule of thumb for flu globally, even though in some places which were particularly vulnerable, like the Inuit in Alaska, it might kill 50% in, 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 mm -hmm. in a local mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. um, but it, there was chilling and the way it would suddenly popped up then in Italy, this was so reminiscent of reading the global newspapers for, yes. from 1918. I've, I've read enough newspapers from the time. Yes. And then the things like the fear um, uh, that a medicine that's very content with itself and thinks it's achieved a lot, like in 1918, they thought bacteriology was going to solve all the disease problems. And along came a virus that didn't respond to bacteriological methods. Mm -hmm. And we similarly, I mean, I remember speaking to somebody um, when my book came out in 2018, a doctor, and saying, you know, what would happen if we had like cytokine storms today? And he said, oh, we've ECMO beds to deal with those. And mm -hmm. I said, well, how many have we? And he said, four. I said, in this hospital? And he said, no, in the country. Oh, my goodness. And, you know, in Germany, they had big banks of them, and we had four. And I said, well, you know, there was about 800,000 people down sick and 23,000 people died in 19... In Ireland in 1918 and yes, 1919. Yes. How do you think we'd cope then? Yes. And I think, you know, that conversation or that memory may have come back to him at yes. some stage. Yeah. Um, but of course, he's a wonderful doctor. Um, but I don't think they were prepared for, no. for the extent of this. Yeah. I don't think politics realised it. I think medicine realised it because doctors mm -hmm. would always say, to, doctors were always yes. very keen to get yeah. me to talk to different medical groups. Yes. Yeah. Um, before it ever, this ever happened. Yes. And they would always warn me, this is going to happen soon again because of mm. various disease outbreaks like uh, SARS and MERS. So it's a big one will happen. Mm -hmm. And of course, Mike Ryan of the WHO now warns that the next one is still only around the corner, that this may even not even be the big one. Um, but what I, I suppose, and I heard Sam McConkey echoing the kind of numbers that died in 1918 in Ireland, he warned that over 30,000 could die. And I was saying like 23,000 died then without mitigation. Mm. So, you know, that's why the lockdown was so necessary and probably saved so many lives. Yes. And yeah. I was quite pleased that, um, well, I wrote about 50,000 words in newspapers, but that a lot of people seem to value 
the work of not just me, but other people who'd worked on the 1918 flu in Ireland and internationally as yes. well. Uh, because it was the closest comparator, certainly in terms of the numbers of ill and the global scale. Mm-hmm. And thankfully, thanks to modern medicine and to good compliance and now vaccination, we hope we'll have much less death than the 50 million that are over that died then. Mm. Uh, I think it's about four and a half million that have died globally. Really interesting statistic um, that in September, um, the US equaled the number of dead from the 1918 flu. So Whereas I think, was Ireland, there 80 we, million, did you say, in 1918? Between in the world? 50 and 100 million. Oh, 50 and 100. Yeah, yeah. Sure, I'm sure we were over that now with COVID. Have, um, we, have we extended that? Or no, um, between 50 and 100 million, sorry, died from it. And uh, uh, between one fifth and one third of the population suffered it. Right. And the population was only 2 billion, it's now 7 billion. Yes. Um, so. Um, now I think we have over five million who have died from it. In so the it's whole not world. Nearly, in the whole world. Right, okay. So, so even though it's awful, it's because, you know, mm. everybody's in most places have responded so well. But I find that st- statistic from America particularly shocking. Yes, it is Given high. that they were the kind of global leaders of public health in 1918, 1919. Yes, yeah. uh, for comparison, Ireland lost, as I said, 23,000 in 1918, 1919. And on the island, we have, um, I think it's about 8,000 now. So we're, we've we've done really well. Our lockdowns I think we have, yes. have really changed. And yes. there's a lot of families. We don't know who we are, but must should be thankful for that. Yes. While, of course, you know, it's awful for the people who have suffered it. And I know so many of my friends. Oh, it's dreadful. You know, yes. and your family and mine have yes. long COVID. You yes, know? we have, yeah. 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 Um, what's really interesting, too, is to see in modern terms how flu was politicized, you know, particularly in America, but also by um, groups here at home, radical groups. And in 1918, 1919, um, of course, we were in the middle of our decade, you know, and um, there's an extraordinary thing. The German plot uh, or the trumped up German plot um, where when it looked like Britain was going to impose um, conscription on Ireland mm-hmm. because the Germans were getting very strong in the war since they had been able to close down the Eastern Front and they were focusing on the Western Front because, of course, the Rus- Russians had pulled out of the war because yes. of the revolution. Yeah. And they were upping the U-boat campaign uh, in the Irish Sea and, of course, the Americans had decided to come in and help. Um, and the nationalists really became very strong in, in, in the um, anti-conscription movement. So people who are very familiar names in Irish uh, politics, like Eamon de Valera, Arthur Griffith, etc., um, uh, Maud Gunn, um, Kathleen Clark, mm-hmm. Constance Markovich, whose room we are here in. That's, I was just yeah, thinking yeah. that, yes. Um, they were rounded up um, under trumped-up um, charges of being involved uh, in conspiracy with Germany. Mm-hmm. Uh, they weren't tried, they were interned in Britain. Uh, I think 70 or 80, the number's quite fluid because some were let go and more are brought in. Um, but they, they, they were put into various jails in Wales and in England. And that was May 1918 when they were taken away. The women uh, were brought to Holloway. Yes. Uh, but there was only three of them there, or four of them in yeah. all, I think. Yeah. And um, they, um, newspapers, Sinn Féin quickly adapted it into the propaganda and they kept warning, look, this dread disease is about and our prisoners, uh, you know, our people are already weak from previous incarcerations. Yes. Um, And if something happens to them and if they're not getting the proper medical care, because, of course, many of the prisons that they were brought to are actually quite empty. And uh, the doctors who would have been treating the, the working in the prisons normally were away at war, right. just as yes. they were at home. Yes. And um, they um, had to get in. They were delayed getting in doctors and things. And first of all, uh, Richard Coleman, who had been on hunger strike with Thomas Ashe the previous year when Thomas Ashe had died, and he was a war hero himself because he, well, a national hero because he'd been out in Ashburn in 1916. Uh, he was from Swords and he died uh, in Usk from the flu. And the newspapers were full of very dramatic stories about his, how his brother was kept outside in the rain and wasn't allowed in until after he died. Mm-hmm. 
And that um, happened just days before the December 1918 general election. And one of the extraordinary things really about Irish history is this story has been ignored for many years. Yeah. You know, um, yes. I have a colleague, Elaine Callaghan, um, here in Carla College, who's written a book about um, elections in that period. And she is one of the first people to actually mention the flu uh, in relation to politics at politics, the time. Politics, yes. Yeah. Um, and I think my chapter um, in my book on, on the politics and the flu um, is... Uh, I suppose it was one of the nicer things to research in a way because it was more, um, I'm loath to say fun, but it was interesting to uncover yes. the different things that had happened and how Sinn Féin really adapted flu as propaganda. And then the flu played right into its hands by it killing did. Richard yes. Coleman, which of yes. course was unfortunate, but it also gave Sinn Féin the opportunity to save, stage a huge patriot fu funeral through the streets of Dublin, to have the details in the newspaper as people were going to vote. And then the big uh, funeral took place the following day. And then in the spring, another um, a guy who'd actually been elected an MP uh, in Tipperary, Pierce McCann, who'd been very prominent in the anti-conscription campaign, a uh, very handsome man. Um, I've read his correspondence in, in the National Library and it, it is full of uh, you know, charming letters being written to him. <laughs> and. Um, he uh, was particularly fearful about the flu, uh, not surprisingly, because he would have been very worried about his, his family at home. And um, they talked about him being almost paranoid about it and almost like he felt that something was about to happen. And sure enough, he got the flu. Um, mm. They had, the prisoners at that stage had been, they'd had a staggered release and he was actually in a nursing home in, in um, Birmingham and um, um, I've read some of the accounts, Geraldine Plunkett in particular, described, um, you know, of going over there to help mind them and how sick he was. But he died on the 6th of March. Oh. And the impression was given that he'd actually died in prison, but he had been released. But, but I mean, he caught the flu in prison. Yes. And again, there was a very big uh, patriot funeral through the streets of Dublin. And then the Sinn Féin flag was put over uh, an entire carriage. Uh, from Houston Station down to uh, for burial in, in ceremony in Thurlis and the burial on the family plot in, in Duhalla in, in Tipperary as well. And um, the members of the new doll who had been released already walked behind the cortege through the streets of Dublin. So again, you know, the impact was very much there. And yet this story wasn't told. It's amazing that it wasn't yeah. told. Mm. Thank you very much, Ida, for that lovely interview and all that information. And I'd like to talk uh, thank uh, Carlo College for giving us this beautiful facility today. Thanks very much. Well, we're very pleased that you can use it and thank you very much for having me. Yeah. Thank you all for listening and we invite you to explore more of our podcasts and video series documenting Carlo's and Ireland's Decade of St. Eamons.